Hey everyone, welcome back to a new episode of The Dark Parade. My name is Bo, I am one of your hosts for this evening. I will be joined in a moment by Richard Glenn Schmidt, a uh, returning guest on this show, and a guy who I admire very much. He's got an encyclopedic knowledge of obscure Euro horror, which makes him kind of the perfect guy to talk about this movie with. Uh, January is going to be a little bit of a different month than what we've done in the previous months, where we've done mostly series. In this month, we are going to just be doing four movies that I happen to like uh, and and would like an opportunity to discuss in a little more detail. And we're starting off with a really bizarre, almost experimental kind of film called Lose. Not to be confused with uh, Lose, Garden of Evil, Flower of Evil, one of those two. Both of those movies exist on Shudder. So uh, if you want to watch this movie ahead of the conversation you're about to hear, uh, be sure you get the the German one from 2018, Uh, not the other one, which is probably also German from 2019 or whatever. But anyway, Lose is a story of possession. Look for something about devil and possession and you're going to find it. Um, It is a different kind of movie for sure. It is definitely uh, adjacent to the mainstream, but is by no means a, a mainstream kind of movie. Uh, but you'll hear us talk about kind of our first interactions with Luz and and how we felt about it and so forth. But uh, I hope you enjoy it. We're going to be doing not just this movie, but three more movies that are just kind of one-off films that are movies that I just want to talk about uh, that I find uh, to be really good. So January is going to be a bit of a, you know, what does Bo like? kind of month, uh, as opposed to last month, which was uh, what has Bo not seen. Um, so I hope you will, uh, stick with us this month. Uh, we've also got plenty of other stuff. We've got heart of horror coming in, what you watching. And, uh, very soon you will be hearing, um, the best of 2021 list, uh, coming to, to your eyes and ears. So, uh, that will be dropping, if you're listening to this, on the public drop date on Wednesday. That should be happening on Friday. Uh, so, enough advertising. Let's get to the actual movie. And uh, anyway, sit back and relax. And uh, here's me and Richard Glenn Schmidt. And with me yet again is the uh, the lovely, the mustachioed Richard Glenn Schmidt, uh, who, as uh, repeat listeners of this program will know, is the host of Hello, This is the Doom Show. Or maybe I should pronounce it more like Hello, This is the Doom Show. <laughs> and uh, a, a writer and blogger and a horticulturalist. Uh, yeah, all of those things. But Richard, thank you uh, for joining me on this inaugural episode of what promises to be a month full of movies that I like, and I don't really care what anyone else thinks. <laughs> well, we got to start with this one and then cover all of its sequels in, in uh, twenty years. Let's hope. Oh man, I, like I, in my mind, The Exorcist is sort of a sequel to Lose. Um. But yeah, so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the movie Lose, uh, which just came out a couple of years ago. It's a recent film yeah. for for, uh, for a show like this. Um, but where did you first encounter the Lose? Well, this is definitely not Lose, colon, Flower of Evil. That's also a movie. Yeah. Lose is 2018, just in case folks go to Shudder and they're like, there's two loses. Which do I lose with? <laughs> and I'm like, the other one's probably good. I haven't seen it, but there's only wins with lose. I'm a real loser. <laughs> yes, me too. Uh, my buddy, um, uh, David Yannick, um, he, I forget the name of the company, but he was in, he was uh, helping out with distributing this film at festivals and he was hyping it pretty hard. And I checked out the international trailer 
which is just a super short teaser trailer. And literally every frame was making me like really like totally excited in the above pants area, like in my my head and shoulders. I was excited to freaking watch whatever this movie was. Had no clue what in the freaking heck. Sorry for my language. Mm-hmm. I had no idea what this was about at all. No clue. Just knew I had to see it. And it did not play anywhere near me, sadly. But um, alternate, Altered Innocence um, put it out. And then right around the same time, Shudder picked it up. And this is the film that got me to get a Shudder account. I did not have a Shudder account. I was kind of waiting to see how it was going. But as soon as they got loose, I was on it. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Especially considering, like, Shudder ain't afraid of a Gialli film. And mm-hmm. they have a, a, a pretty good library at this point. Oh, yeah. They keep freaking just dumping stuff from, um, I think it's Severin that they have a really good... It's probably Severin and Vinegar Syndrome, but yeah, they just put that um, Umberto Lenzi slash Carol Baker box set because mm-hmm. uh, Carol Baker was um, quite a favorite of Mr. Lenzi, and he liked to use her uh, <laughs> in his films, and uh, they're all crazy, all of them. Yeah, yeah, I I think, jeez, uh, I want to say it was not Derek. Anyway, somebody did that box set with Duncan over on uh, his series and I had listened to a handful of those and I can't remember uh, anyway not important yeah. uh, my my lack of ability to re- recall a thing not the most uh, exciting podcasting anyway <laughs> speak for yourself I love it <laughs> yeah great so I yeah I, I feel like well I didn't have anybody like an association with anybody who was distributing the movie but I had kind of gotten wind of this and as being, you know, both artsy and fartsy. And when I hear that, I'm like, well, I might like that. And uh, so I tracked it down. I don't know if it was Shudder or if I saw it prior to the Shudder release, but pretty much from the, the moment I saw it, I was like, oh, wow, this is actually kind of genius. And I will say from Jump, this is one of those movies that I will readily admit, not for everybody. This is uh, damn near an experimental film. Yes. And and that's kind of what I love about it. But also, it is the reason why I understand that when people are like, I don't get it. This movie makes my head brain hurt. Um, Uh, Would you like to hear my wife, uh, Lietta's three word review of this oh for sure (laughs) so i was talking you know she has to listen to the constant barrage of my my ugly horrendous uh sometimes sonorous voice uh you know in her ear all day every day and i was talking lose and talking lose and talking lose and finally played it for her finally i was like oh here it is this is the movie i was telling you about and then i watched it you know i'm watching her watch it we're watching it i'm watching her watch it credits and she looks at me and she goes is that it yeah yeah (laughs) and i was like i like your style and yes that's the best review i've ever heard (laughs) right i i think that you kind of have one of two reactions to this movie which is it is i love this or is that it and i think both of those are totally accurate Yes. Um, so, at any rate, the uh, let, let's as as listeners of the show will know, we will approach this using five uh, chapters, if you will. And I think this, uh, I you know, I'm gonna damn us by saying I think this may actually be a pretty quick episode, just because there's <laughs> not that much plot. No. Um. And and then we'll get to the rest of it in a minute. But usually the plot part takes like 45 minutes. I think it's going to take like 15. But we'll see how this goes. Um, so basically this begins with the character of Luz, as played by Luana Velas, um, going into a, a police station, grabbing some shit out of the vending machine, 
and then screaming at the guy behind the desk who does not seem to be paying much attention to her. <laughs> and and uh, I'm trying to remember the exact line. I'm, I'm, I need to look it up. But it, it's the gist of it is like, is this what you want your life to be? And yeah. it's one of those things, man. Like, if somebody screams that at you, then they're either your life coach um, or they're about to murder you. <laughs> and they, the answer is obviously, always, resoundingly, yes. Yeah. Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's so bizarre. And so then we cut from that to and that goes on for a while by the way what that that short description of that scene is probably eh, five-ish minutes of of the runtime for a movie that's like 80 minutes long and I, maybe not even that long um and so we go to this bar where there is a, a dude a lady and a bartender and this has such Lynchian kind of vibes to it, which is another reason I really like this movie is that the whole thing feels like you're in somebody's dream. But the, this lady uh, named Nora Vanderkurt as played by Julia Riedler is, is the actress's name is uh, kind of eyeballing the dude at the end of the bar and finally goes over to sit and chat with him and is buying him a drink and they're making these cr like crazy tequila concoctions. Yes. And she's kind of asking him initially, like, what do you do? Are you a doctor? Your beeper's going off. Does that mean you need to leave? Is this an emergency? Are you a surgeon? And that kind of thing. And the guy's being fairly tight lipped uh, through all of this conversation and then uh, Nora decides that, well, I'll just tell a story of my own. Like, it starts with her not, like, undressing him with her eyes so much as, like, chewing on the marrow in his bones. Like, this lady is intense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's as intense as he is, like, cold and aloof. And, yeah, they're drinking these drinks that don't exist. Right, it it looks like the kind of drink you would get at the bar in Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. the The director he he talked about having these drinks made because uh, he really wanted them to be like have like a ritualistic like a salt and tequila, but more complicated. Yeah. So they also had to come up with a way for it to change color. So they added a bunch of weird shit to it. This weird like tea that would change color with sugar or a uh, temperature change. And uh, when the dude looks like he's struggling to drink it, it's because the drink tastes disgusting in real life. Yeah, sure. I would, I can only imagine what kind of foul tasting stuff that was. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so, th so this woman, Nora, um, starts talking about this girl that she met in, uh, in Catholic school. And as a savvy movie viewer like myself, Richard, pretty quickly you're like, wait a second, I don't think you went to school with her. I think something's going on here. Uh, because she also starts this conversation with a little bit of a story about like, oh yeah, I was riding in a taxi with a friend of mine and she threw herself out of the taxi. <laughs> and he's like, what? Uh, and she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it happens. And then uh says that, like yeah i met this girl named Luz in uh in in her catholic school and there's you know like it's very clear that she speaks admiring admiringly of Luz uh but also is like yeah 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 she was you know she was in catholic school school but she wasn't that good. You know what I'm saying? She was a little bit of a, a, a hellion, uh, quite literally, as it turns out. And um, basically the, the story she tells is about like this, 
Luz was uh, a, a, a had a friend of hers who was pregnant, maybe. Right. And as the narrative goes on, I think we kind of understand that Luz maybe convinced this girl that she was pregnant just so that she could perform this ritual. Yeah, it's it's hinted at that Luz has special abilities. Yeah, right. So uh, she's a she, medium, she, yeah. Right. And if she tells you if she, if she tells you that the air around you stinks of fish, you'll smell the fish. And if she tells you that you're you're pregnant, Mr. Bo Ransdell, you will believe you are pregnant. I'm pregnant? No, no, if she says oh, it. Oh, okay. Woo. But but she did say it. What? Um I'm I'm pregnant. I walk a walk. But yeah, and so she basically convinces this schoolmate of hers to have like summon a demon to take care of this little problem for her. <laughs> and and Luz uh like her incantation is like uh, you know, our father who art in old men's crotches, you know, like stinky be thy name. She has like a whole rigmarole that she does. That's kind of this yes. bastardization uh, of of the Lord's prayer. And the doctor is like getting increasingly drunk as she's listening to this woman, Nora, tell the story of Luz. And finally the uh, the the guy's like oh shit i got an emergency on my beeper i gotta go and she's like hey, 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 hey before you go how about uh we duck into the bathroom real quick and do a little hubba hubba or something and so she basically just drags this guy into the bathroom and the moment we know that something crazy is afoot is that she starts giving him this kiss, but then there's a big glowing light between their mouth parts. Mm -hmm. uh, which is how you know it's love. Yeah, it's it's the first moment in the movie, too, where uh, when they're in the, the stall together, she's facing away from him, and he's like, you're bleeding. And you see that she's got this uh, head wound that's just been bleeding down her back of her neck and down onto her jacket this whole time. And it's like, oh... This this is getting different, and then of course, that kiss. Yeah, and she kind of like basically infects, and you know, let's just call it for what it is. It is her basically swapping bodies. The demon inside of Nora hops into the body of this doctor, who uh, immediately is not drunk anymore because demons don't get drunk apparently. Which is kind of a, you know, a bum it's rap for of, demons. It's like Captain America. It's very sad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or uh, all the synthanol stuff on Star Trek. And they're like, well, we're just going to drink these drinks, but it doesn't make us drunk because we have to operate a starship through space. And you're <laughs> like, man, well, that's a bummer, you know. I mean, I, I would want those people to unwind. Well, that's why they're always sneaking Romulan ale onto the ship and... <laughs> getting fucked up <laughs> I mean not the Yalman and you know the people who work in engineering but Bones is constantly dragging out oh Jim, oh, Jim boy I got this bottle of Robulin ale that I traded morphine for or whatever um, I know uh, I know Worf he's got something to say about it he didn't like that Worf probably has his own Cleon booze though oh that's true because the Klingons definitely get drunk. When the he probably has like a bag of, of the like uh, of some warrior's bones, like like powder that he snorts to get high. Yeah, like when uh, Riker had to was doing the exchange program with the Klingons and oh, had God. to learn how to eat all the gross shit. <laughs> that's that's good fuck or whatever. <laughs> Uh, that is good fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, but the demon is not drunk and then goes to the police station where we saw Luz enter earlier. 
And it turns out that the demon is now possessing the doctor who has been called to evaluate Luz, who has shown up at this police station with um, a, uh, a, a, a in detective named Bertillon. And there's a translator, because Luz is uh, Spanish-speaking, um, named Olarte. And Olarte is kind of in this sound booth while Bertillon is uh, outside with Dr. Rossini, is the guy's name, who is the doctor who we know as the audience has shown up all possessed like. Right. And this is uh, like the most elaborate um, like interview slash evaluation of anyone that's ever gotten arrested but turned themselves in. Well, she shows up because, you know, <laughs> as we learned, she threw herself out of a taxi cab and I guess is coming to look for protection. Oh, okay, that makes sense. You know, and, and, and that's why, and probably showed up, and the reason they called the doctor is she showed up and was like, hey, I got this demon chasing me. And it, there was this lady in my backseat who I thought was my old school friend, but it wasn't, it was a demon. And so I had to jump out of the car and crash it. And they were like, you know what? We're going to get a doctor in here to take a look at you and see what's up in <laughs> with your old noodle. <laughs> I'm glad you explained that. This is like my this is like my fourth viewing and I'm like, oh, I'm learning something. <laughs> yeah, the narrative is very, like, it does not lay anything out for you. A lot of this is yeah. my conjecture, but that's what makes sense to me. Yeah. Uh, what is I mean, a, Go on. Sorry, my, my initial thought when I started this movie was, oh, the, that lady's got an alien in her. Because I didn't even know it was like a possession story. So and, and and my you, first viewing was very confusing. Well, and you kind of don't until there you see the ceremony later right. in the film. Um, but yeah, so the doctor is like, all right, hey, here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to whip a little hypnosis on Luz. And shoot, using hypnosis will basically walk through the events of the evening, and that way we'll be able to determine what the hell happened, why did she jump out of this taxi, and so forth. And if you thought the movie was artsy before, oh, just you wait. <laughs> because now it does this, like, juxtaposition positioning of or juxtaposing I guess would be the, the word of Luz in in the room where they have kind of constructed this like half ass car out of uh, a mic stand and some chairs and flashes back to her in the car and this is where sure enough the woman that we saw before in the bar gets in the, the taxi with Luz um, they're kind of chatting about like, well, what have you been up to? And, and so forth. And as soon as Nora starts to, it, I, I believe it's when she starts to quote the like, our father who art didn't mince crotches or whatever, that as soon as she says that Luz is like, oh shit, this isn't actually the girl from, you know, Catholic school that I knew. This is that stupid demon that I conjured. <laughs> that has a, has been creeping on me for a while and you're like hey demon just use facebook <laughs> you know i never turn my phone off come on uh but yeah so so what we realized that what's happened is that she saw the 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 demon uh or the demon possessed nora and, and tried to kill her, essentially. Like, jumped out of the taxi, let, lets the, the car crash, and then she went to the police station, is my understanding of events there. And, but then we go further back and start, you know, regressing Luz to the point of her being in school. And this is where we learn of Marguerite, the, uh, the girl that Luz had convinced was pregnant and has like gets her to strip down naked in the Catholic school 
and puts a bunch of candles around her and and invokes the demon and sure enough the demon comes and possesses margarita and and at that point it seems like Lou's just kind of booked out of the school and has been on the run ever since is kind of my impression yeah and it's it's intimated that margarita died from this experience yeah yeah and and like Lou's and this is something that I'm also kind of putting together from some of the conversations about um of, of, of the director of Tillman that the idea is sort of that Lou sort of put all this behind her and has been trying to lead a better life or at least a life where she's not running around conjuring demons <laughs> but unfortunately for her this demon kind of took a shine to her and is it has been on the hunt for her and not like I'm, I'm I want to kill Luz but more like I I'm kind of in love with Luz yeah yeah she uh, the demon when she's in Nora she even refers to Luz as my girlfriend and you're like is it like my friend friend like girlfriend or do you mean my girlfriend <laughs> like what is what is going on with this uh, this uh, odd couple which you know one of them is very unwilling to be a part of the relationship yeah and once Lou starts to freak out a little bit as like all these memories are are, are flooding back the possessed doctor kind of puts the whammy on the detective as well yes and it's like I'm gonna need you in a minute but for right now I just need you to stand here and shut up <laughs> And maybe my favorite part of all of this business is the fact that this dude, Olarte, the, the the translator, essentially, is in this booth like, the fuck is going on? What What's happening? And, yeah. <laughs> and once he starts to suspect that this doctor is not who he seems to be, there's a great line where he says, how long have you known Spanish? And the doctor says, since it was invented. And yes. you're like, oh, it's so good. Yeah, uh, I, I love I love Alarte like uh, just getting terrified and just locking himself in this booth. Yeah. And like, I'm not coming out. And yet he continues translating because he's like transfixed by what's going on. He's, he's, he's terrified for his life, but he's also still doing his job. But, yeah, but I also <laughs> think that... It, that makes him a bit of the audience surrogate where you're like yes. you're completely consumed nice. by what's happening in in the film but you're also like wait what now what did and there was there was a satanic ritual at this catholic school and then what and uh then the so as we're going back in time and you're getting more and more of the backstory about Margarita and what happened with all that stuff, the room fills with fog. And it, it becomes, I mean, not since John Carpenter's The Fog has there been this much fog in a film. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and so the demon basically busts into Alarte's room knocks him out like throws him against the wall or something and knocks him out and then appears before Luz as margarita you know naked as the day that you know presumably she died and then kisses her and and like the ultimate fulfillment of the movie is that this demon puts the kiss on uh, Luz possesses her so that they can be together you oh, know man. and then Luz like the last shot of the movie is Luz leaving this police station while you hear Olarte on the lawn because uh, Bertillon is following Luz out but she's still got the whammy on her right 
and is just w walking out with her to, to make sure that she kind of leaves unmolested, I assume. Yeah, has her sign out. Yeah. You know, the, the official paperwork and everything. <laughs> Yart is like, no, right. shoot her. Or shoot it. Shoot it. Right. Don't let it escape is what he uh. keeps screaming. And the movie ends with Luz walking out the door. And this dude that we saw at the beginning at the desk just continuing to go about his business. <laughs> <laughs> and now there's this demon loose on the world possessing a girl who can kind of make you believe whatever she wants you to believe. So yeah, that should be fun. Right. I mean, what <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> and those are kind of the big events. Like, am I leaving anything out? Um, Mainly, like, I think the only thing really is... um. You forgot to say, man, this, this shit's fucked up, dude. Yeah, okay. So no, you got it. You got it. You totally got it. You got all the, the big events. All right. So that is the plot of the movie. Again, this is like record time. We, we have <laughs> summed up the movie. But it, it's only 70 minutes long. And also, it is heavy on style, lighter on actual plot. Yeah, he heavy on um, loaded dialogue heavy on like conversations with multiple meanings multiple interpretations i mean i suspect you know in a few years i'll have a different idea of what this movie means <laughs> yeah i mean well all right so let's let's talk a little cast here uh yes. which is phase two of the show for uh regular listeners so there's luana velas who plays Luz who is great. Oh my god, yes. She has the this great kind of stare that you see a lot in the film. Uh, she's just got a really expressive face, um, and, and she's just terrific. Like, you know, kind of... The fact that you understand, like, oh, she's not exactly a good person, uh, but she she seems to be trying to be better... But, yeah. you know, again, you, you understand that, like, she did some kind of heinous, super anti-Catholic shit back when she was in Catholic school. Yeah, and, you know, her, the actress, you know, you see her as, as younger with this huge, immense chip on her shoulder and just feeling like, I'm guessing, feeling like strangled and put upon by all the, the ceremony and, and having to you know, bow down and deal with the nuns, you know, measuring, you know, how long is her skirt, you know, to make sure she's not improperly dressed and she's dealing with the, the, uh, the kind of like, uh, hypocrisy of lot, you know, I guess a teenage girl in that situation, like having to deal with her roommate getting laid in the bunk above her and just, and she's, so she's really bitter and yeah, she, she chooses, not the best way to cope with her with her bitterness and but yeah the, the performance is so good like you know you've got like three versions of her, her as this young person who's angry <clears throat> who's angry you've got her as an adult just trying to get through life driving this cab no nonsense not taking any bullshit from annoying ass people getting off of planes and then you've got her kind of fighting for her life with this demon it's oh man it's such an awesome awesome gal yeah she's terrific in it then there's uh julia riedler that we mentioned earlier who plays her you know friend from school nora oh god who like you oh. said just has the most intense looks and is this great combination of being menacing and kind of sexy and it, it like it's it, it like her manipulation of the doctor is so much fun to watch because she is clearly so in charge and <laughs> it, and it's it's wonderful to watch i think she is fantastic yeah. in this movie when, when she tells him to stop interrupting it's like oh yeah this is good <laughs> yeah oh she's so good and 
And speaking of, the guy who plays Dr. Rossini is a guy named Jan Blutart, um, who is also very good and, yeah. like, also manages to be kind of dopey at first. Like, he just seems like a, a, a regular schmegular dude. And by the end of the movie, when he is putting on a dress to, you know, basically insert himself into the fantasies or the the memories of Luz and he's just so psychotic looking and I mean I, it's just I, I don't know if it's just a quality of Germans in general uh, I was watching the interview with the director and he was talking about how he's known that guy for like since he was a teenager not uh, not the actor the director's known him since he was young and because um, the director's older brother went to this like prestigious uh, German acting school, and so he made friends with with Jan, and so he knew him. And uh, he said something like, "He's like, oh, I, I I don't agree with the the proper German acting schools with their their method acting. I, I think they're dangerous, and they 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 like tear people down to build the, to get them down to like their core elements." And then they build them back up so they can be good actors. And it's, it's like, that shit freaks me out, man. <laughs> and I'm like, so that's what happened to Jan, which is why you get to see his swinging dick in the movie. Yeah, yeah, you sure it do. Is fearless, dude. He is nuts. Yeah. It, like, he, I mean, I mean, we see his nuts, but I mean, he is like a fucking crazy, unhinged, but not um, like, it doesn't get silly ever. No, 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 no. It is like weirdly pairing this movie with something like Der Samurai. Oh, baby. Is kind of it that feels like these two movies are almost of a type. Um, this is a little more quick and mean and leaner than Der Samurai, but it has that kind of vibe of just like it, it's weirdly playing with gender lines and with religion and like all of these ideas are just kind of floating around the movie but none of them ever completely coalesce into into something and in in some movies that would be a complaint but in lose it's like oh yeah yeah, yeah. this is just a, a movie that kind of happens to your face because <laughs> oh you know and it's so like actor's studio kind of a thing where they do the whole let's recreate through this hypnotic scenario let's recreate this cab and recreate the events and so you get to see you know Luz and uh, Nora interacting in a in an actual like taxi cab mm -hmm. you know albeit on a sound stage probably but then you get to see them doing that scene with four chairs under fluorescent lights and nothing, you know, it's like, it's just one of those fun, uh, like a, like a, it's like a mental, I don't know. It's like, it's like a, a weird puzzle. I can only imagine them trying to put this together in the editing room later. It's just, it's just like, Oh, it's like a mental exercise for the viewer too. Like you're going to like, you kind of know this is a, um, this is pretentious. Like this is a very, um, stagey thing to do but they had a great excuse for doing it and so I'm like totally into it yeah it, it's definitely a movie that I think demands the viewer be a, an active viewer of the film like you can't yeah. just sit back and at the end of the movie you know it's not as, you and I both are big fans of the Marvel movies but those oh, are yeah. completely passive entertainment like those are movies that happen in front of you and then you leave and you're like, oh yeah, that was fun. This yeah, the, is... A the, the hardest part with Marvel is not jerking off during the, the whole movie. Right. It's it's restraining the masturbation. Whereas in this movie, the movie's like, go on, masturbate. <laughs> what are you waiting for? Right. What We dare you. I'm doing it. Right. You want to see a dick? Here you go. <laughs> You want to see this man sculpted behind? Enjoy. Right. How about how about this young girl in in the all together? Well, here you go. You know, 
And yeah, because I mean, the character of Marguerite, uh, speaking of fearless, this girl, Lily Lorenz, uh, plays Margarita. And it's the same kind of thing where you see her both in this interrogation room reconstructing the events of the Catholic school and also in the scene where she's in the Catholic school where she's, you know, laying naked in this uh, circle of candles and and it kind of becomes the element or the, the tool of the demon seduction for Luz because it, it's ultimately this this image that Luz embraces of, of Margarita. Um, and then again, a shout out to Johan Beneke as Olart, the Olarte, the, uh, yes. the translator who has the haunting last lines of like, don't let it escape. Um, he's wonderful. And as we said, just the moments of him staring out of this booth and just being like, what in the ever living fuck is happening out there? But also, there is no way I'm opening this door. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I, I wonder, because uh, this movie gets uh, lumped into uh, uh, queer cinema. And it was um, the director, he, he's like, I was writing it just without thinking about things. He's like, I have, you know, I'm a straight, like, you know, male I just wrote this and magically the characters genders or the way they are perceived just kind of happened. And so I let the screenplay kind of do what it wanted to do in that regard. And he's like, I just want to be up front that like, I'm not a, you know, a, a, a queer person, but I'm like, I, I hope this finds an audience that understands it, you know, like, cause my guess is that Luz was in love with Margarita, which is why she did what she did as like revenge for her having sex with some rando guy, presumably. <laughs> right. And then she, she's the impetus for her to accept the demon inside her as maybe sort of a redemption for what happened to Margarita. Or yeah, you know, she, something, maybe that's something, but also, you know, like um, uh, Nadia uh, Strubiga, I, mean, I, I have I love saying German names. Mm -hmm. uh, who plays the the cop uh, Bertillon? She is very masculine. Incredibly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and she is just such a she's like, this is a cop I would not mess with. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah, no, <laughs> on any she, day. She looks and, like she know, could both throw and take a punch. Yeah, and she's you know she's quick to to draw her freaking. Uh, her pistol and start freaking firing once as soon as she regains control of herself. But, you know, it, it adds a, another layer to the film of like, you know, like, is this, you know, meant to be a transgendered character? And, you know, like, what does it mean? Is it just something you don't even, you're not supposed to even think about? It's like, yeah, there's just all, gosh, so much to unpack in this little movie that like, like you said, that, that it takes, you know, 15 minutes to get through the whole plot. Yeah, well, and I think that all of those ideas of, of gender and, and gender roles and gender identities and that kind of thing, like, from... The, the thing that's fascinating is most of this movie is told by the demon. And so, yes. for the demon itself, and, and, you know, Olarte doesn't say, don't let her go. It's don't let it go at the end of the movie. And so for the demon itself, it's like, well, well I don't give a shit about genders. That doesn't right. mean anything to me. You know, I like, I, I'm just here about possession and power. And I feel this connection with, with Luz. But, you know, that affection, I don't think is constrained to her femininity. Yeah, I think it's it, a lot of it. I think has to do with her power and the fact that she was so, you know, like brazenly thumbing her nose at Catholicism, and was basically just kind of that, like a uh, not just a vessel for evil inside this Catholic school, but had this element of power as well and the, this you know healthy 
uh, disregard and disdain for religion. And I think that's what attracted the demon. Nice. Um, but yeah, it's, again, this is all open to interpretation and it's what I really like about it is that you could write three different essays about sexuality and gender in this movie and all of them would be right. Yeah. And then as a side piece, go ahead and do one about the religion, the religious angle of this. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Of, of the fact that, well, and we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, but um, so any, any other performance stuff that you want to shout out here? Cause I don't want to sell any of this short. Cause I think all the performances yeah. are, are genuinely great in this. Hey, the guy at the desk who never says a word. That's my favorite guy right there. He, right, the Dennis Franz <laughs> of Germany. <laughs> and now the award goes to this guy for man at desk. Right. Yeah. In a, <laughs> ineffectual bureaucrat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I and There's definitely something to be said for like, you know, <laughs> her screaming at this dude is this what you want your life to be and the guy's totally nonplussed by it it just there is no introspection there's no like he doesn't get angry about it it's just like oh another one yeah another nut off the street yeah (laughs) and all right so i think that brings us then to just the the uh, the themes of the movie which we've already kind of touched on the idea of like gender and sexuality and religion um, and I think the religion one is one we, we haven't really fleshed it out, but I think it's really interesting because it, it you know, you kind of start with a bad girl who just gets worse <laughs> at the end of the movie. <laughs> and, and I guess maybe the real victim of all of this is Margarita. Yeah, she, she really got the short end of the stick for this on this it's terrible you know, and there's also, I, you know, again, if you were writing a thesis about this, you could definitely uh, make an argument that the movie is also about the destructive nature of this sort of obsessive love of like, this is the person I'm going to be with no matter what. And I'm going to leave a trail of wreckage in my wake to get to them. Yep. Uh, but also... How awesome is it that the, like, I don't know that I've ever seen a movie that, for like, forget all the fact that it's like, this is all shot on 16 millimeter and uses all these primary colors all over the place. And it looks, it's got this great electronic score and it's just European as shit. Um, <laughs> all of that stuff aside, I don't know that I've ever seen a movie try to take the idea of possession from the demon's point of view like this yeah the the movie it reminds me of although it doesn't do that that immediately makes me think of is the black coat's daughter yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you've got the person who is in love with their demon they were they were like they never got over the demon being exercised from them and they're spending the rest of their life doing evil deeds in order to impress the demon and get it to come back and possess her again. So it's like, uh, it's, it's not from the, uh, the demon's perspective, but it's from another weird perspective of a person who, instead of fearing that loss of control, that, uh, that, of being possessed would obviously, you know, be kind of, of a problem for you. Uh, they 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 just miss the companionship so badly. It's just like, ugh. I love possession movies that do something weird because possession films are one of the most, uh, for me, totally tired, overdone. It's it's not like I'm never gonna watch one again, but. I love these movies that do something weird with it. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and yeah, the black coat's daughter is an interesting pairing as well, uh, where you, you get the love affair from the human point of view and loses all about the demons point of view of like, 
look, it was just kind of, you know, I had to have her at first sight uh, with uh, the the lovely and talented Luz. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I, again, it's hard to say exactly what the overriding theme of the movie is because I think it's playing with about seven different ideas all at the same time. Uh, and none of them are ever like finalized. There's no moment in the movie where you're like, and so this is what that means. You know, it, it, it's more like, well, let's play with all these ideas and get into the weird psychology of the demon. And then you're kind of out again. The movie's 70 minutes long, so it, it doesn't linger. It just does what it does and then gets the fuck out. Yeah, this this would have been um, a fucking nightmare at two hours, you know? Yes, yes. <laughs> that, like, all of the weird, like, <gasps> the camera work and all that stuff, it would have been intolerable. But it, it's just the right, as short it, as it is, it is absolutely the right length. Yeah. Um, all right, all right. So let's go to, before we, we grade this thing. Let's uh, do some final thoughts, and I'll I'll start because I, I want to let you run wild here. Sure. I think it is. It's surreal. It's very dreamlike. It, it it's a movie that haunts me. As, as you know, Luz leaves the police station with Alarte screaming like, "Don't let it escape!" But it's all the stuff about the relationship between Luz and the demon that I have so much fun sort of plucking at the threads of that in my mind and and even as i watch it like again this is a this is a movie that kind of demands that you pay attention and that you're engaged with it otherwise it's just a bunch of colors on the screen yeah but i think if you're paying attention it's incredibly rewarding as a thought exercise as much as anything else um and then i will shut up and let you do your thing <laughs> Well, I mean, it's it's. I don't think it's going to be uh, a secret at this point. This is one of my favorite films of the 2010s. Um, it, it certainly um, exceeded uh, the, the little bit of hype that my my pal gave it, and it, it uh, yeah, um, it just hits me so hard. The soundtrack. Uh, by a guy named Simon uh, Waskow or Voskow. He's only done this film and one of the director's other short films. And then apparently he's involved in the uh, the, the uh, Tillman singer's um, next film, um, Cuckoo, which I'm very interested to see what in the world that's all about. But it's one of my favorite scores also of the last, uh, of, you know, the 2010s. And Shout out to my friends, uh, Marky and Carrie, who uh, they watched this film with me for my first time as well. This was, I uh, just went to their house and we watched it and uh, we loved it. And they got me the freaking soundtrack uh, for my birthday. And man, it is get, it's gets a, it gets a lot of play in my house. I really love it. Um, one of the things that shocked me about this was the interview with the director on the disc um he is um not a dick and he's not weirdly superior he's talking about pretentious things but he's not doing it in a pretentious way i don't think um he's very matter of fact like um i was making short films at school and um i wanted to make a longer film and the school was very supportive so the school and our fundraising and then volunteers got this movie made. So this was his thesis film for college. And, uh, he mined a lot of the Catholic, uh, Catholic schoolgirl stuff, uh, from his wife. His wife was from uh, South America. And so, uh, a lot of her experiences were, um, in his brain as he was writing this, he insisted on using 16 millimeter film because, uh, they, they gave, a, he took a class on how to do 16 millimeter film and just fell in love with it. And he's trying to never go back to digital if he can help it. Um, the influences I thought were really funny. He's like, 
yeah, 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 uh, Suspiria, but, you know, the taxi cab scene and uh, the thing, because, you know, the John Carpenter's the thing. You don't know who's possessed. And uh, a book called The Master and Margarita. And I'm like, okay. And then he just moves on to the next question. <laughs> like, it was, I thought that was really cool. Um, and this, like you, never leaves. My, like, after I watch this film, I can't get it out of my head. It's always kind of in the periphery of my thoughts. I, um, I really adore it. And it's uh, just endlessly rewarding. And I, I freaking can't wait to watch it again. Excellent. So The Master and Margarita is a Russian novel. Yes. Uh, which is a, a visit by the devil to, uh, to the atheistic Soviet Union. And it just sounds cool. Like, it, it's yeah. like, I'm really bad about, oh, that was based on a book? I'll get to that in a decade, you know? Yeah, it, no, that sounds really interesting. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a, a satire about so the Soviet Union. Anyway, um, so, uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything that you said. Uh, if, if I were going to, which <laughs> I'm not going to uh, hy hypothesize that we will rate this movie. Let's just rate this movie. Um, <laughs> on, on, on a scale of five stars, I give it a solid four out of five which is very high for me. I, I, I think it's one of those movies that it requires a specific kind of mood. <laughs> it's not a movie I want to watch all the time, but also if I'm in the mood for lose, ain't nothing else going to do. <laughs> um, cause there's nothing really quite like it. Yeah. And, and that's the, the thing that I think is, is most like exciting about the movie is that, even after watching it again for this discussion, one of the things that I kept going back to was like, I've, I still, there has never been another movie that does what this movie does in the way that it does it. It, it captures this kind of weird Euro horror vibe, but it's also a possession movie, but it's also from a perspective you don't normally get. And all of that stuff ma makes it kind of wonderful for me. So uh, what about you? On a on an, I, as always, we do allow half stars, no quarter stars, because we're not monsters here. But um, <laughs> where's this land for you? Oh, you know, it's a full five for me uh, easily. Um, I I love how rare uh, German, like really good German horror, can be. Um, they had a little problem called World War Two. <laughs> and so I I, I, uh, I saw some stuff on the History Channel about this. <laughs> so so Germans weren't real uh, hip to wanting to do anything that was horror. Uh, that's my that's my theory. Um, you can look at uh, the fifties and sixties and seventies of German horror, and <clears throat> you might have one horror film for every decade. Like it's it's really strange that they. Uh, they were more than happy to do uh, crimmy films and make Edgar Wallace mysteries like the the, the German uh, um, Lederhosen wearing version of the Giallo. Uh, they love churning out those those you know inherited schemes or some villain out to get revenge and using bizarre methods to kill people. But then straight up horror like zombies or vampires like nah. And for someone like Werner Herzog to do Nosferatu was like a total weird anomaly. So, you know, you'd have German money as like co-production making horror films. But it wasn't until like really the 2000s. You know, yeah, the, the indie, uh, the indie like backyard zombie films like Andreas Schnoss and, and those dudes making like these splatter epics. But it's really really unusual to see a horror movie of any kind <laughs> much less of this quality coming from germany um and uh it's just it's just so God, I'm, I'm just gonna spiral out so yes like i said five out of five folks give this one a chance please excellent well uh, as always we like to wrap things up with three things that you may not know about this movie um, you kind of got one already. Ooh. 
which was that this movie was uh, Tillman Singer's uh, film school thesis project. Yeah. Uh, which I do think is very cool. Like, this is his student film, and holy crap. <laughs> like, uh, if my student brought me this movie, I'd be like, well, you're teaching next semester. <laughs> Welcome to my job. Yeah, right. <laughs> you have to, You have done well, my son. Um, <laughs> so the, the other thing, and you touched on this, but just to explore this a little more, that, yeah, a lot of the, uh, the backstory comes from uh, Tillman Singer's Colombian wife, um, who in an interview, I, I like this little detail, uh, that she would pretend to be a very devout Catholic when she was like eight, nine years old, because uh, as he put it, uh, she wanted the nuns to give her stuff. It, and he, he says, what amazed me the most is that she turned from the most horrible, manipulative child to the kindest adult. <laughs> and, um, uh, the, they joke, the devil has definitely seen that, and it doesn't matter, because when she dies, she's going straight to hell. Um, but he, <laughs> that, that was kind of the genesis, he, he says, from that stupid joke. I thought, yeah, if there is a devil, he would definitely hang around Catholic schools to pick up, uh, the way he puts it, is the best of the worst there. And nice. Yeah, so that that's part of the origin, and, and thirdly is when he was asked directly about this being a love story, um, and he, he he says, not really love, it's more about lust. And um, he says uh, that he meant to write more about love, that he meant to write more about a demon in love, but in the process, he found that this demon doesn't have a body, so he goes into people and possesses them, and he says, is that not the most toxic relationship that there is? And that was his <laughs> idea at heart. Nice. And uh, so that, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think Tillman Singer is a guy who's dealing with kind of lofty and esoteric ideas, but doing so in a way that is, and the film itself is kind of esoteric, but he's not like up his own ass about it. Right, uh, which I think is the uh, what Nietzsche said uh, is don't don't stare into the abyss and then find that you've gone up your own ass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the abyss smells terrible. Why? Why is there so much corn in the abyss? Oh, doctor. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> but. But yeah, so that is uh, that's lose again. Not not the longest episode we've ever done, but uh, it's a pretty snappy film, and I feel I feel like we've done it enough justice that if you haven't seen it, like even though you know the beats of it, you can't spoil this movie because yeah. it's so much of an experiential kind of film, um, and you absolutely if anything that we've talked about sounds like something you might enjoy then uh, please check out Lose. It is available on Shudder. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you've got the AMC Plus as well, I think it's available there, along with all the, the Shudder goodies. But it's easy to come by, is the point. And uh, it, it is not... Again, if, if, you're, if the height of horror for you is the Friday the 13th franchise, maybe this ain't your movie. Oh, but, no, no, they'll love it. They'll love it. This is basically um friday the 13th part three but not in 3d yes it, there there is only two dimensions unless you count the dimension of love which is shelly yes oh god uh i don't <laughs> want to talk about this anymore this show's over um richard <laughs> where could people find more of your stuff. I know I mentioned the upfront, but remind everybody where they can they can find you. Sure. Um, hello, this is the Doomed Show, or, or hello, this is the Doomed Show, or as we like to call it sometimes, Jello Jello, who moved the tombstone, is uh, right here <laughs> on good old uh, LegionPodcast dot com, and uh, please listen to us, and we will be fulfilling in your demon hole. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it honestly, I it, it's a show that I listen to religiously or anti-religiously. 
uh, and adore. I, I oh, I'm very Thank excited you. that you know, like you've been doing some solo stuff recently, which has been great. And then uh, in the coming year, um, oh yeah, there's going to be all kinds of fun stuff with uh, Simon and Alvin and Theodore. Yeah, yeah, we're 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 gonna be back with the boys all in of, the uh, in the 2022. It's gonna be great. All, all of right. the chipmunks will be showing oh, up. Yeah, we're just gonna slow their voices down, so I'll be really super low, but they'll sound normal. Great. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, hey, thanks as always, man. I really appreciate it. Dude, thanks for having me. I love it. All right. Well, that is the conversation with Richard Glenn Schmidt about the movie Lose. We had a wonderful time, as you heard, uh, talking about this obscure and interesting piece of, of horror filmmaking. Um, you know, I he almost talked my score up on this movie and still might the more i think about it the more i think maybe i undersold that movie a little bit but uh anyway i hope you enjoy the movie if you check it out if you don't uh feel free to drop me a line let me know why i'm wrong um you can do that at dark parade pod on twitter or you can hop over to facebook and uh find me at the group the dark parade uh as i said in the upfront we've got a lot of stuff coming this month uh it is going to be a busy january here at the Dark Parade with lots of fun stuff. Uh, I would also encourage you to check out the uh, the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts, where you can get most of these episodes a couple of days early, uh, as well as some exclusive stuff from a lot of the creators around Legion Podcasts. And uh, be sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. Uh, where not only are there YouTube versions of all the podcasts uh, that that show up on Legion Podcasts, uh, but uh, every now and again I'm able to sit down for an hour or so and play some video games, and you can uh, come just kind of hang out and and chat uh, as some of you have done, and I really appreciate uh, hanging out and just get kind of chit chatting while while playing some games. And I think that's going to do it for this time around. We're going to be back uh, next week. Next week is going to be a hammer effort called the brides of dracula it starts peter cushing but interestingly not christopher lee and yet it's maybe my favorite of the hammer vampire films uh but we'll get into that with guest Derek bourgeois uh next week uh until then have a great one and everyone thank you as always for joining the dark parade see you later